Hi Bobcats! This video will look at the process of writing electron configurations. Our objective is to write the full electron configuration for an atom. In the next video, we'll look at writing a short version, which is known as the noble gas version. Let's start with an example of an electron configuration. So uh, an electron configuration is the, the way that we show how the electrons are distributed among the various subshells in an atom, or we can even do it for ions. So as an example, helium has two electrons to account for. We get that number two from the periodic table. That's the atomic number of helium. The atomic number tells us how many electrons the atom has. When we write the electron configuration for helium, it looks like this. 1s2, and that's how you would read it. You say uh, the subshell, 1s, and then you say the exponent, 2, so 1s2. And the 1 that's out in front is telling us the value of the shell, 1, 2, 3, and so on, that the electrons are located in. The combination of 1 and s is saying which subshell it's in. It is in the s subshell in the first shell, which we refer to as the 1s subshell. And then that exponent is telling us that we have placed two electrons into that subshell. On this slide, let's take a look at a number of different electron configurations. The first one is hydrogen. Uh, hydrogen has just a single electron, and so its electron configuration is 1s1. Argon has 18 electrons and has a bit longer electron configuration. It's 1s1, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p6. There are a couple things I want to point out. Um, since the exponents are telling us how many electrons are in each subshell, if we add them all up, we should get 18. So if we take all of the exponents, so let's see, the first one's a 2, and then the next one's a 2, the next one's a 6, the next one's a 2, and the next one's a 6. Uh, let's see, working backwards, 6 plus 2 is 8, plus another 6 is 14, plus another 2 is 16, plus another 2 is 18. So that all, that all checks out. The sum of the exponents should give us the number of electrons that we're working with. And let's see, let's take a look at another one. We've got nickel with its 28 electrons. Again, if you add the exponents, um, you should get a grand total of 28. But what I'm also wanting to point out is notice how the pattern is repeating. Um, as we move from, after we start, well, we are always going to start with the 1s subshell. Then after it's filled, we go to the 2s subshell every time. And then once that's filled, we go to the 2p subshell. And even in an element that has a lot more electrons, like barium, we see that it all starts with the exact same pattern. Um, we end when we've run out of electrons. Uh, sometimes, like in the case of hydrogen that ends with that 1s1, we have an unfilled subshell. Also in the case of nickel, we had an unfilled subshell. Um, D can hold as many as 10, uh, but nickel didn't need that many. It doesn't have 30 electrons, it only has 28. So we stop when we get to that 28th electron. Um, I also just wanted to point out to you um, in harmony with the, the previous lecture that um, an S subshell can hold a maximum of two electrons, then it's filled and we have to go to the next one. A P can hold a maximum of six, and a D can hold a maximum of 10. Um, and so once we hit those numbers in those types of subshells, we have to move on into the next subshell uh, for placing those electrons. And oh yeah, if this uh, configuration doesn't need any F subshells, but if we had an F, it would hold at most 14. While it's nice that these electron configurations follow a pattern and that the subshells are always listed in the same order, remembering that pattern uh, can be a little tricky. So we're going to look at two different ways of doing it. One of those ways is 
um, known as the Aufbau principle, and we draw this little diagram. Well, actually, the Aufbau principle just means that we're going to build up an electron configuration by taking the electrons we have to work with and placing them into the lowest energy subshell that's available. But um, that knowing which one comes next is a little tricky. And so this diagram over here on the right um, gets drawn to show what level to put them in. And so basically, if you follow this snaky line around, it will take you through the orbitals in the correct order. So if you have this diagram or you draw this diagram, um, you'll know what order the orbitals fill in. On a test, I will give you this diagram. Uh, what will be missing on the reference sheet for a test is this up here at the top. I expect you to know that if we're talking about an S subshell, which is the first column in this diagram, we can put at most two electrons into one of those subshells, or for a P subshell, six, for a D subshell 10, or for an F subshell 14. So if you choose to build your electron configurations this way, make sure you draw in um, the maximum number of electrons on your diagram when you start the test. On this slide, we're going to mark up the periodic table so that we can use it to help us write electron configurations. The first thing I'd like for you to do on your printed copy of the table is to make sure that the rows are numbered one through seven on both the left side of the table and the right side of the table. Pause if the, the video if you need to. The next thing I'd like for you to do is move the element helium over to group two so that it's sitting right next to hydrogen and above beryllium. So we want to move helium over there. We do this for electron configuration purposes only. Um, the helium only has two electrons, and so those two electrons uh, are going to go into the 1s subshell. And um, so we just want to make sure that we put uh, helium in the right spot on the table to help that. Also, if you have the uh, version of the periodic table um, from our course's Canvas site, we also want to get rid of hydrogen on the right-hand side of the table. Um, so there shouldn't be anything on row one over towards the right. Everything on row one should be on the left. Okay, the next thing that I would like for you to do is to mark the S, P, D, and F blocks. Now on this table, they're color coded. So everything that's blue is the S block. Um, if you don't wanna color code your periodic table, you could just simply write in S block and indicate those two columns. Um, the P block is all of the stuff that's in purple. The D block are the 10 columns that are in orange. And then the F block are those two rows down below, the rare earths. Yeah, so another name for the rare earths is F block, and another name for the transition metals is the D block. And then the S and P block taken together are the main group elements. Okay, so now that we have those blocks marked, um, notice that we're going to number um, within the blocks as well. So the first row of the S block is numbered 1S. So that's going to be the 1S subshell when we write an electron configuration. Um, so in, in the S block, that number that we write out in front matches the row number. We can say the same thing for the P block. Um, if we're looking at the second row of the P block, we're going to write 2P. But it's different in the D block. In the D block, when we are on the fourth row of the table, we are going to write 3D for the subshell. And the F block is going to actually be two less than the row number, because for instance, this row right here really squeezes up to right here on the sixth row of the table. Um, and so what we're really looking at here with 4F is two less than the row number. Uh, but now that I've said that, don't worry about F electrons. I'm not going to ask you to write any configurations that use F. 
So that's just their FYI for enrichment. Okay, so the way we're going to interpret this diagram for writing electron configurations is we are going to ignore the element names and symbols that are in the periodic table and focus just on the atomic number. The atomic number within a, a square on the periodic table um, is going to tell us where that numbered electron would go in an electron configuration. So for instance, if we were looking at element number 14, so the atomic number 14 would be right about here in the periodic table, that's, that position tells us that the 14th electron in an electron configuration goes into the 3p subshell. In fact, electrons 13 through 18 are going to go into the 3p subshell. Um, and in fact, if we have 18 or more electrons in our electron configuration, part of that configuration is going to say 3p6 because we're going to completely fill that 3p subshell. Um, and when we're writing the electron configurations, all of the subshells that we write are going to be completely filled except for the very last one. And I like to start by writing that very last one so that I know when to stop writing in all of these subshells. If you're using our classes version of the periodic table, uh, hopefully now that you've done all of that marking up, you're looking at a table that looks something like this. Um, if you skipped that part, please practice that because on a test, you're only going to start with a blank periodic table. And so you're going to have to know all of the things that you've got to write in to mark this up. So when we write an electron configuration, um, the way I like to do it is by starting with that last subshell so that I know when to stop. Sometimes I work my way backwards through the table from that. Uh, sometimes I'll, I'll just skip back to the beginning and start with the 1s subshell, then the 2s. Um, and every subshell that I write counting up to that final position in the periodic table will be full. And then that final one will only be partially full. Beryllium has four electrons, so when I look at atomic number four on the periodic table, it's on the second row in the S block, so I know it's going to end at 2S. And then when I look at where it is within the S block, it's in the second column, so I know it's going to be completely full with two electrons. Um, before that, if I go backwards in the periodic table, I have the 1S subshell, and all of these underlying subshells will be completely full, so 1S2. Fluorine has nine electrons, and if I look at its position in the periodic table, it's on the second row in the P block, so it's going to end with 2P. Now, how many electrons go in there? Well, when I look at that row for, for 2P, and I start counting over at boron, which is the first one in that, that row, I count over 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 before I get to fluorine, so it'll be 2P5. Now, working backwards through the table, before 2P, I have 2S, and that'll be completely full with 2. And before 2S, I have 1S, which will also have 2 in it. Uh, for argon, it's atomic number 18. 18 is on the third row of the table, so I know it's going to end, uh, and it's in the P block, so I know it's going to end with 3P. And argon is in the sixth column within the P block, so that'll be full at 6. Going backwards through the table, electrons 11 and 12 are in the third row in the S block, so that's 3S2. Going backwards, I'm hitting the 2P subshell, and that will be completely full with 6. Then the 2S subshell, which will be completely full with 2. And then the 1S subshell, which will be full with 2 as well. Element number 24, chromium, has 24 electrons, and that position is in the D block. But now remember in the D block, we use one less than the row number. So it's on the fourth row, so I'm going to call that 3D. And within the D block, uh, chromium is four columns over, so it'll end with 3D4. Right before 3D, we have the um, S block on the fourth row, so that'll be 4S2. Uh, counting backwards through the table, we're going to hit the 3P block, so that'll be 3P6. And then continuing backwards, I'm just copying the one we just wrote. Um, after 3P, we do 3S2. Um, then going backwards, we have 2P6, then 2S2, 
and then one S2.